Nicholas Trist was a brilliant American diplomat who successfully negotiated the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago on February 2, 1848, after the three-year Mexican-American War. Trist attended West Point, studied law under Thomas Jefferson, and served as a private secretary to U.S. President Andrew Jackson. U.S. President James K. Polk sent Trist to negotiate the treaty to end the Mexican-American War and played a major part in opening the West. It should have been the crowning achievement of his career. Both Polk and General Winfield Scott, the commander of U.S. forces in the conflict, were both unhappy with Trist's presence in Mexico. The U.S. Congress also failed to agree on how to resolve the $10 million in war debt that Mexico owned to America after the war. Many in Congress didn't feel the U.S. should acquire any land at all from Mexico, since they felt that the white race shouldn't mix with another race, while others felt that all of Mexico should have been annexed by the U.S. Trist was sent on a diplomatic mission to Mexico by U.S. President James K. Polk to arrange an armistice, but Trist disagreed with Polk and ignored his orders to start bargaining with Mexico's President Santa Ana after Mexico lost the war. Trist capitalized on a brilliant diplomatic opportunity by secretly continuing to bargain with President Santa Ana, which resulted in America acquiring much of the land now occupied by California, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Nevada, Colorado, and Utah, which facilitated America's westward expansion. The Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago brought an official end to the two-year Mexican-American War and was signed on February 2, 1848 at Guadalupe Hildago, a city to which the Mexican government had fled with the advance of U.S. forces. Nicholas Trist negotiated with a special commission representing the collapsed government, led by Don Bernardo Cudo, Don Miguel Aristotel, and Don Luis Gonzaga Cuevas. The peace talks were negotiated by Nicholas Trist, chief clerk of the State Department, who had accompanied General Winfield Scott as a diplomat and President Polk's representative. Trist and General Scott, after two previous unsuccessful attempts to negotiate a treaty with President Santa Ana, determined that the only way to deal with Mexico was as a conquered enemy. President Polk had recalled Trist under the belief that negotiations would be carried out with a Mexican delegation in Washington. In the six weeks it took to deliver Polk's message, Trist had received word that the Mexican government had named its special commission to negotiate. Trist determined that Washington did not understand the situation in Mexico and successfully negotiated the peace treaty on his own, in defiance of the president. In a December 4, 1847 letter to his wife, he wrote, Knowing it to be the very last chance and impressed with the dreadful consequences to our country which cannot fail to attend the loss of that chance, I decided today at noon to attempt to make a treaty. The decision is altogether my own. The events of the following months dramatically prevented Mexicans from pursuing the stubborn, however just, defense of their territory. The Mexican officials finally had to accept a negotiation with Trist that was difficult, painful, and undignified for negotiators on both sides. This is revealed by comments made by Nicholas Trist to his wife regarding the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hildago and the attitude assumed by Mexicans with regard to the U.S. invasion. Just as they were about to sign the treaty, one of the Mexicans, Don Bernardo Cudo, remarked to him, this must be a proud moment for you, no less proud for you than it is humiliating for us. To this, Mr. Trist replied, We are making peace. Let that be our only thought. But, said he to us in relating it, Could those Mexicans have seen into my heart at that moment? They would have known that my feeling of shame as an American was far stronger than theirs could be as Mexicans. For though it would not have done for me to stay so there, that was a thing for every right-minded American to be ashamed of, and I was ashamed of it, most quarterly and intensely ashamed of it. The purpose of the Manifest Destiny was the driving force behind the rapid expansion of America into the West from the East in the 1840s, and it was heavily promoted in newspapers, posters, and through other mediums. While Manifest Destiny was not itself an official government policy, 
It led to the passage of legislation such as the Homestead Act, which encouraged westward colonization and territorial acquisition. It also played an important role in American thought. Many felt it was America's manifest destiny to overspread the continent, and that through expansion, the United States would become a recognized political and social superpower. America had been uniquely chosen for the task of expanding westward, driving out the wilderness and establishing civilization. Numerous government campaigns painted the allures of the West for prospective settlers and promoted programs which could help people acquire and hold land in the West. The far-reaching impact of Manifest Destiny was clear. A section of the Manifest Destiny editorial reminded Americans that they were uniquely positioned to spread democracy throughout the world, and this concept clearly played a role in 20th century American foreign policy. Many historians use the term Manifest Destiny to refer to the period in American history which was marked by rapid expansion from sea to shining sea through annexation of the western half of the continent. What was Trist's reward for single-handedly negotiating trillions of dollars worth of new land for the U.S. government? Upon return to Washington, Trist was immediately fired for his insubordination and his expenses for a two-year period were not immediately repaid, which caused him to live a life in poverty almost until the end of his life. Anyone wishing to contemplate the part chance plays in human destiny might give some thought to the career of Nicholas P. Trist. His act of rare courage and principle for a cause he believed to be right cost him the support of the president and brought him dismissal, disgrace, poverty, and the total disregard of posterity. Most historians have neglected him entirely or dismissed him as a man of no ability, overlooking the fact that Trist was a victim of an unpopular war and an administration that neither understood nor sympathized with his difficulties or his aspirations. Immovable on matters of principle, Trist determined to do what he considered right, and for this, as well as for the tangible effects of his deed, he deserves better of his country. What the nation obtained as a result of the treaty he executed single-handedly was the boundary of the Rio Grande and the cession of territory between that river and the Pacific Ocean, which includes the present states of California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, Arizona, a corner of Wyoming, and the western slope of Colorado. Because of the efforts of Nicholas P. Trist, James K. Polk is remembered as the president who, except for Jefferson, added more territory to the nation than any other. I, I would say that the treaty was mostly a negative thing for Mexico. It, it's, um, it created um, a lot of distrust of the United States um, and it kind of put Mexico in a humiliating situation. Um, on the other hand, you can say that the treaty at least um, kept the United States from taking over a larger part of Mexico, which was desired by at least a certain portion of the United States um, at, at the time when the negotiations were going on. So in that sense, it prevented a worse um, possible outcome for Mexico, but overall it was a deeply humiliating thing for Mexico. Henry David Thoreau, one of America's greatest authors and philosophers, was jailed for refusing to pay taxes to fund the Mexican-American War since he felt it was an unjust war. While in jail, he began writing the essay entitled Civil Disobedience to voice his disgust with the U.S. government. India's independence leader Mohandas Gandhi and civil rights leader Martin Luther King Jr. were inspired by Thoreau's arguments in the essay, which helped them launch their own nonviolent campaigns against unjust laws. In 1848, Henry David Thoreau wrote, The U.S. government itself, which is only the mode which the people have chosen to execute their will, is equally liable to be abused and perverted before the people can act through it. Witness the present Mexican War, the work of comparatively a few individuals using the standing government as their tool, for in the outset, the people would not have consented to this measure. 